This podcast is brought to you by Art Novian, engineering exceptional acoustic panels, including the all new Sub Trap, a tunable bass trap treating as low as 40 hertz. Art Novian, passion for acoustics. Learn more at artnovian.com. Hey, it's Larry Crane. Welcome to the Tape Op Podcast. Ken Scott is an undisputed legend. We interviewed him way back in Tape Op issue number 52. His work with the Beatles, Elton John, David Bowie, George Harrison, Supertramp, and countless others has him firmly planted in the middle of some of music's greatest albums. We caught up with Ken at this year's NAMM show in Los Angeles and chatted about his amazing career. Enjoy. This audio recording was not originally tracked with the intent of using for a podcast. It was recorded solely for transcription for our print interview. Please forgive any balance issues, background sounds, or lack of clarity. Enjoy. I'm now a a visiting professor at Leeds Beckett University in in Yorkshire. And uh, I I never feel I'm utilized properly because I, I go in there and I will lecture to students. The mm-hmm. best way for me for people to learn from me is to watch me work. Right. It, it's always the better way because we do some do things so instinctually that you can never really talk about because you don't even realize you do them yourself. Right. Always. But, uh, I mean, I think you know the story of when every engineer you've ever worked with as well or watched work mm. could have the same gear as you. Absolutely. And they'll set it up just slightly different and yeah. it sounds very different. Yes. And you're like, subtle. Yeah, no, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. I know that feeling. <laughs> Excellent. Where, what studios were you working out of in the in the day that did have sound techniques consoles? Trident. Trident had yeah. them initially, oh, before yeah. they built their own? Yes. Oh, that's But they still, they still yeah. even after building the A range, mm-hmm. that was only in the studio. The mix room still had the original sound techniques board right. until I think it was about 70... 77, 78. Yeah. And so everything that was recorded was still being mixed through Sound Techniques board. Really? That it's what's what's gone through the, that original board is just unbelievable. From it was the Hey Jude board. Yeah. Uh, right. Then used for recording so, uh, uh, three and a half tracks from the White Album. Right. Uh, we did all of the overdubs and mixed uh, All Things Must Pass. Right. Uh, all the early Bowie stuff. Elton John, Stones used it. In fact, the Stones went out and bought one, and then they eventually donated that to studio in, in Kingston, Jamaica. Oh, wow, right. So it's, it, the, the lineage of the, the Sound Techniques boards is amazing. Right. And most people have never heard of them. Right. That's what we were talking about. I was talking to the new owner today, yeah. and I was like, I know what this is. I know what this means. Yeah. And I know a lot of records. <laughs> and, Absolutely. You know. More, it's when I first started to talk with Danny about it, it he's got the the list of uh, even now I think it's still a partial list of, of the, the records that have been done through Sound Techniques boards across right. the world and right. I had no idea I, mean, I knew the Trident I, uh, ones I knew the Sound Techniques studio recordings right. but John some, Wood yeah and yeah. the first two uh, Pink Floyd oh yeah with singles. Joe Boyd producing yeah. and yeah, yeah beautiful recordings yeah I want to try these these new ones out yeah. because I've never got to touch one of these consoles. Right. And so many of the records that influenced my whole career were done on mm-hmm. them. Yeah. And I'm really fascinated because there's a lot of, it feels like they extract quite a bit of detail to me. Yeah. Like something in the circuitry and, you know, Jeff Frost's uh, vision for that. Yeah. You know? No, it was amazing. So well, what have you been up to lately? You're living in London, or living in UK Yorkshire, now. Yeah, Yorkshire, yeah, North Yorkshire, yeah. yes, near Leeds. Well, it, yeah. it's te- teaching, doing masterclasses, basically. Excellent. I do. I did a project. Year, I guess, about a year ago now. We completed it. Uh, Dave Rowland's album, uh, old 
Poor David's Almanac is what it's called. And, uh, tomorrow we'll find out if he's got his Grammy for one of the songs on it. Oh, wow. So we're hoping, yeah. hoping. Yeah. That was that was great. We did it at uh, Woodland Studios, which is uh, Dave and Gillian's. Oh right. Studio. In Nashville. Oh yes, all yeah. analog. Yeah. Oh, it was it was amazing. It was right. And they're such such great people. They yeah. really are sweethearts. Do you find that you're you're if you're drawn to a project, it's it's partly like utilizing your classic skills of of tracking acoustic music, musicians together, things like that. Sure. It, you know. It, 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 my my discography is so sort of left from what, left to right field basically yeah. i've done so many different types it's of true. things it's but true. For, for me i always do everything basically the same i it, it's <laughs> the musicians and the music that changes it's not me that changes right right uh, we, we, and that's something i try and put across to students it's we in the control room we're there just to add that little sparkle everything yeah. should happen in the studio the performance the song everything should the sound if you if you have a shitty drum kit you're never going to get a great sound yeah you start off from the right place with a good sound in in the studio then we in the control room might have to do very little yeah yeah makes sense you know we don't wanna, look yeah when i started four track with the beatles it the amount of EQ we had and the effects we had were minuscule so right. it, you can't do much so you had to get it right in the studio and so I, I learned that way and it still goes for me today it's yeah. you get it in the studio first yeah I mean that's an ideal way to work how do you how do you feel when you see when you work with sessions where it's pro tools and plugins and, and I don't uh, <laughs> <laughs> I do Pro Tools. I, right, obviously, right, I right. do Pro Tools, and I use plugins, but very limited. I prefer hardware, and if 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 I want to attempt uh, attempt it, I will sometimes use a Fairchild plugin, six hundred and sixty. Right, Just right. the the plugins are nothing like the real thing, but it, it's. Closer than anything else, right, right? So I will, I will sometimes do that, but I don't use very much. Yeah, yeah. It, it's that was one of the funny things. The first thing we put up on the desk downstairs yeah. earlier was uh, a track off of Billy Cobham's Spectrum album, mm -hmm. and I hadn't put up the multi-track in God knows how long. <laughs> and what what was amazing was all the faders were at zero. There was no EQ or anything, and just hit the button to start playing it. And there it was the mix. Right. <laughs> if you get it right in the beginning, you don't have to do too much at the end. Right. And especially uh, in the days, I just finished an album that was all 24 track, reel to reel. Okay. And I was writing fader moves while we were tracking. Right. You know, yeah. Yeah. Because I'm like, I don't want to deal with this later. No. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> you know. But I hear of mixing engineers that get Pro Tools files to, to mix, and there are like 15 different guitar solos because no one's made a decision. It's ridiculous. Dave Pensado told me yesterday or day before about 350 track sessions for mixing. And he has to have assistance just to start sorting that out for him because. Oh, that's. Uh, it's ridiculous. It's pathetic. 350. <laughs> it's pathetic. I loved when you put up Rocket Man down there and you were getting the instruments in and you pushed up one fader and we heard a doubled vocal. Well, that. In all honesty, no, that is oh. on two tracks. Oh, it was on two? Oh, I thought I, it was because, on one. Because we're limited down there as to what it is. Oh, right, I've right. got them coming out the same channel. Oh, God, okay. But, but, but if I was to bring up the George Harrison track that I have down there, that is the double track on one track. Bounced together. Yes. Well, the way we got all the vocals for, uh, backing vocals for All Things Must Pass, yeah. it would be, it was all George. Wow, and yeah. And we'd record one part on three tracks, on the fourth track, he'd be singing live and I'd be bouncing the three to, to one. Right, then right. we'd do the same again with the second part. Yeah. Only I'd, quite often I'd be mixing the first track, the, the track with the first four vocals onto the, the next part with the three as he's doing it live. And oh we just kept gosh. on going on like that. Yeah. And it was great. That, yeah. And so we got it mixed as we're going along. We, right. you, you don't yeah, have to done. do it. It's done. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh yeah, I mean, it, how was it? A, is it a trip to go back to like 
you mentioned the Billy Cobham session, yeah. or to come back to something you tracked initially, um, do, you, do you feel sometimes back in the headspace or the feelings of the time? Oh, absolutely. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, sometimes even more so. Yeah. Like, at one point, when uh, I can't remember which track it was, I know it wasn't Life on Mars because I've worked on that lately. Yeah. I think it was one of the Elton tracks I brought up. And just as I was putting it together, it was, I was getting the hair on the back of my neck was standing up. I was, oh, this is fucking great. It, it's, yeah. you know, it, it, some yeah. good performances. Yeah. You know, it's no, they, we, th those were the good old times. And yeah. I, it's, I, look, I'm 70 now. I know yeah. <laughs> every 70 year old is supposed to say, oh, the good old times. I yeah. walked through seven foot snow with no shoes on. No, it's not quite <laughs> like that, but no, it, it was the golden age of, of recording. I, yeah, Absolutely. Obviously, I, I mean, I hit that timing perfectly. The fact that we still want to talk about it. Yeah. I mean, when you're in the moment and you're making records, sometimes it's very temporal and you're like, maybe no one's going to care about this in, ever for in a year or whatever. Well, but, but, it's a but, pop hit. You know, that's maybe. what we always felt. Right. It, it, because of the, the, the contractual obligations the artist was under at that point of one album every six months, our feeling at the time was that when the next album comes out in six months' time, if people are still talking about that first one, we've done our job. It's lasted <laughs> for six months. Yeah. We never realized 40 or 50 bloody years. It's ridiculous. Right. And Man. it's a shame because we should be talking about today's music. It's just, not, yeah. Yeah. Do you do think, have you heard anything recently, like over the last five years, that you are really enamored oh, of? Oh, well, <laughs> Dave Rollins <laughs> and Guinean Welsh. Oh, there you go. <laughs> that's easy. Yeah. I mean, that's... And I think the thing that, that you sometimes see with that too is like, this is music that's very much feels performed and, and draws you in. Yeah. You know? I, when I first started to work with, with Dave and Gillian, I, I, I loved it. Not my wife's type of music in any way, <laughs> shape or form. But they were gonna play at the Roman Auditorium in yeah. uh, Nashville. And so of course I had to go along and I said to my wife, you have to come with me, but uh, just try not to fall asleep in the, within the first five minutes. Then you can. The way it turned out, she was not only awake the entire show, as we were walking out, she said, that's the best show I've ever been to. They have this ability to pull people in. We, uh, we did something in Atlanta at the uh, British Consulate's house. It was for Kef speakers and uh, I got them involved. And it was this very, very hip audience, that, that, that small, small group of people, but they were all yeah. ultra hip. Right. Atlanta hip. And these two walk out, Dave and Gillian, with their cowboy hats on, their cowboy boots, and it just, and these people were just watching, what the hell is all this? <laughs> and they, they play, they start the first number, and the people are just, what the? hell is this second number the people were hey this ain't bad this is really good by the third number they were all clapping along <laughs> Dave and Gillian have this amazing ability to pull people in yeah. and it's it's because it's real yeah Certainly. it's real and yeah it's, it's what we're that. lacking today yeah how when you're teaching you know nowadays how do you, you mention like wanting to have the students watch you if you're not doing that how do you it's, How do you teach? How do you? It's just tell them what I do. Yeah. As best I, as best I can, what I know I do. Yeah. It's those things that I don't realize what I'm doing that I can't put across right. in a in a lecture, right? Sort of way. But I, I because I've got multi tracks of uh, some of the stuff I've done, I can right. pull out tracks and say, look, this is what I did here, kind of thing, and right. why we did this here. Right. So it. it I can go a little bit further than, than quite a few people, but it's right. still the best way to utilize me is, is to watch me work. <laughs> exactly. Put, yeah. you, put you on the floor. Yeah. Set some things up. Yeah. Get some levels. <laughs> and I do that in a lot of yeah. places as well. Uh, universities. I do a week's master class in Toulouse every year in November. Yeah. And it's, it's great. It's great. Do you get, how, one thing that's really hard to teach is production. You know, like being oh, on yeah. the floor, making a call. Talking about arrangement, talking about performance. Yeah, absolutely. Stuff like that. How do you feel are good ways to get those across to, a, to one, people that are well, learning? 
With regard to performance, what I always do is I play the end of five years, the opening track on Ziggy, because David at the end of that was bawling his eyes out, tears pouring down his face. And it's, it's that typical thing when you're, getting, when you're doing the mix, you can't get every little nuance across. Right. So things get lost. And you can hear a great performance from him on the, the final mix, but not, you don't get that he was bawling his eyes out at the end. Right. So what I do, I play, uh, and I do this in all of my, my talks, I play the end of five years. It starts off the actual record, and then I fade out everything but the acoustic guitar and David's vocal, yeah. and people hear him. And I've had members of the audience in tears. Sure. It's so moving. And it would get yeah. rejected today. Record companies would throw it out because it's not totally in tune. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Boy, does it I mean, feel great. Yeah. How do you have access to some of the multi-tracks at this point? Well, like time? Elton, uh, I, yeah. I asked for them and Elton said, give him whatever he wants. And I've got <laughs> multi-tracks of, of everything I did with him. Wow, Mad nice. Madman, Honky Chateau, Dolce Man, Olivia, uh, Olivia Harrison gave me a couple of right. Georges. Right. I have to be careful because they're mm. all scared of bootlegs and people sampling and things like that. But yeah, yeah. It's no, I'm, I'm very careful with them. I've been using them for years now and no one's ever gotten anything from that's them. That's excellent. So. I know. I want to hear the raw tracks of Life on Mars. Cause that's one of my favorite songs in the world. <laughs> you missed it. I did that earlier. I saw that tra <laughs> track sheet on the console yeah. and I went, oh, damn it. <laughs> did you hear the new mix? No. Oh, I did a new mix, which was just the piano, orchestra, and David. Oh, wow. Which was really good. Yeah. I saw Rick Wakeman go, was going around and playing it a few times yeah. with people yeah. after David passed. Oh, too. yeah. And it's such beautiful. Well, he piano said work. it's the best piano part he's ever played. And it, it's, yeah, it was amazing. He was practically a kid then. Yep. We all were. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. <laughs> yeah, it's quite fascinating. It's you know? that, that period in, in England. The talent that came out from musicians, vocalists, engineers, producers, it's just phenomenal. Yeah. Absolutely, and yeah. I mean, you were at a lucky time. Yes. I mean, to get thrown into the White Album from the get-go is ridiculous, as you well know. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I do. <laughs> you know the story? I mean, was, basically Jeff Emmerich was working on it, and it's kind of... Well, it started on a Magical Mystery Tour. Oh, right, right. He, he walked out on that once. Yeah, and that's so right. I was Tracking I was just that. thrown in, and the first time I ever sat behind a mixing console was to record your mother should know, and I had absolutely <laughs> no idea what I was doing, none whatsoever. I'd watched people push the faders up and pull them down and turn the knobs, but what they actually really did, I had no idea. It was learning by fire. It, it, it was that's... <laughs> unbelievable. Yeah. Look, that, but that's been that's been my life. It's been so ridiculous from the first thing I'm ever I'm ever an assistant engineer on side two of a hard day's night first thing I ever engineer your mother should know the Beatles uh, first thing I ever produce hunky dory right the, I only ever did one ad and that ad was I'd like to teach the world I'd like to buy the world a coke oh my god and I got a Clio for it the whole thing that was the only right. ad I ever had to do and that got turned into a big single too Didn't after it? that. Yeah, yeah, they took the track that we did. Yeah, we took the track that we did. <laughs> oh my God. And then they edited it to, and then redid the vocals without Coca Cola. Right. That is so bizarre. Yeah, that's some lucky breaks. <laughs> Someone was looking after me oh, from man. up there, I think. <laughs> it's interesting because the, the, there, there are people that, uh, that have a, you know, similar sort of stories and paths, like, oh, I was there at the right time. But, it's really about like the people in the room. It's not yeah. always about just that you know they can turn a knob, right? You, you, it's that collection of people in the room that end up collectively making that music oh, yeah. together. Yeah. And they want people want those sort of people around. Well, well I, yeah, I, I think that the yeah. whole thing I say I didn't know what I was doing with your mother should know. I think that because I'd worked with the Beatles from side two, two of a hard day's night through Rubber Soul as an assistant, I think there was enough of a relationship there that they were willing to trust me when I completely messed up. Uh, he'll, he'll get it. And so I continued. And then it was only a few days later I did, did my first ever orchestral session, which was I'm the Walrus. <laughs> Unbelievable. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, but it, it, there have been so many strange things. When I moved to, to California, 
to Los Angeles. We were staying in a hotel looking for a place to rent. We found a place to rent and I, I was mixing something at uh, A&M at the time. So I dropped my family off at the, the house because they were going to turn the gas on, the electric, all of that kind of thing. Yeah. And I go to pick them up after I finished at the studio and there's no one there. And I'm sitting out in the car thinking, where the hell are they? What's going on? Because this was well before cell phones. Yeah. And uh, I was getting more and more pissed. And suddenly there's a knock on the car door window. And it's one, my eldest daughter. I wound it down. She was with another girl. And she's, Daddy, do, do you know someone called Frank Zappa? <laughs> I said, yes. Oh, well, he lives just over there. And that's where we've been all afternoon. This is Moon. <laughs> oh, hi, Moon. <laughs> I, of all of the places yeah. in, in LA, I get the to place there. immediately opposite Frank. Oh my God. And that, that led to missing persons. Right. Because Frank thought I might be interested in it and he let us use his studio to get it work, <laughs> to get the studio working properly before he came back for us to do our demos. Oh, funny. It's, just, it's, That's unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's unbelievable. I know. It is, it, yeah. But I do have something that no one else has and I don't think they ever will. Whenever there are the the uh, the, the best of the, the best albums over the last fifty years or yeah. that kind of thing, I'm lucky enough to get two or three in there kind of thing. Other people get the same, but the one thing that I have that no one else does, Q Magazine a few years ago did the worst of, and I got number one on that with the Duran album. What record? Duran album. The the, uh, the one where they did all the covers. Oh God! Like, uh, I the know thank that you record. album. I had thank to review you. it. Did you? Yeah, I, re I didn't give it a good review. No, Not it, could, your fault. It, it could have been really. <laughs> no, I know it could have been really good. We were heading in a. It was nothing like Duran Duran. Right. I, I was bringing mi rough mixes home, and playing it for people, and they said, "Who the hell is that?" Right. I said, "It's Duran." That never. Ne but then management and record company got nervous because it wasn't like Duran Duran, so I got booted off. Someone else came in to make, try and make it more like Duran. And it, you can't yeah. change corks halfway through. Yeah, it, it's, that's probably the death of any record. Yes. I mean, you just can't make it into something it's not from right. the beginning. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> it, it's, it's that making decisions thing. It, it's, you know what something's supposed to sound like right from the get go and you follow yeah. it on through. And that's, that's what makes it good. One of, one of my favorite things you did was Crime of the Century, okay. Super Tramp. I mean, yeah. I always, I'm not even a big Supertramp fan in a certain way, but that record is so beautiful. It works. And intense and lush and it, as a, dynamic. As a, yeah, as an album, it works perfectly. Yeah, it, it really it, does. It, yeah. Uh, what, what were some of the things? I, I feel the record has a lot of like dynamic range. Oh, yeah. And what, what were some of the things that you had to do to overcome like the limitations of tape and hiss? And was there anything Nothing. you kind of specifically no. did to no. make sure? Like <laughs> I just did what I always do. <laughs> That's too easy an answer. <laughs> uh, but that's it. it it's no, it, no. You oh. just tape this isn't that bad. We we yeah, were yeah. using Dolby's, okay, so that yeah. got rid of some of it. That answers but, part of my question. Yeah, uh, but it, it's I yeah. when I started to to work with David as a producer, I. I was used to the whole performance thing where there's the producer, the engineer, the assistant engineer, maybe a couple of the musicians, and you're all playing the mix. Right. You're making the changes all at the same time, and you go through it. When I started to work with, with David, he never came to any of the mixing sessions. Right. So it was just me, and how could I make all of the changes that I wanted to make within the mix when it's just me? Yeah. So I started to do everything in sections. Oh, right. I would do the intro, get that right, put it to one side, do the first verse get that the way I wanted it, edit it onto the intro, put right. that and gradually go through. So with, with things like uh, on Supertramp, yeah. on Crime, Bloody Well Right, which starts yeah. off with electric piano and band stack. Right. It continues just the electric piano, band come in again. I had to do all of those in different sections because we'd get, get it right for the so band, you it to the master and then tape. suddenly f faded out. So it's just oh, the right, front. right, right. Then when they come in again, you set it all up, Right. You, that's where you start from, and you edit to edit it to the other right. one. Right. So your master but, mix would have a, a handful of edits oh yeah, at certain absolutely. crucial points. But you pull them yeah. all out, and that's the way you get rid yeah. of the, the tape noise. Yeah, right. And you don't leave them in all the time. Mutes, mutes. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. You know, that's 
What kind of reverbs were you used on mixing that? Too? EMT plate. I thought I felt, felt a lot and of that on there. Occasionally, a, no. no. Occasionally yeah. a Cooper Time Cube, and it was only oh, one. Yeah. It was only one, one plate. One plate. Yeah. Yeah. The Cooper Time Cube is bizarre. Such it, a, it, I know. That's why sound. I said it was only every yeah. now and again. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Find us online at tapeop.com, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Until next time.